Have you ever wished you could eavesdrop on a conversation with a millionaire? My name is Michelle Thompson. I'm a retired project controls engineer and business professor, and that's exactly what I'm gonna do in this podcast. I get to ask the questions that everyone else wishes they could. I'm gonna find out exactly how they were able to build their empires through automation and outsourcing. And I'm gonna break it down in a way that helps you build your business to run on autopilot. Don't miss out on Automate to Dominate. From author Donnie Bovine comes the book, How to Be a Success Champion, available on Amazon. After years of living other people's dreams, author Donnie Bovine decided to jump out on his own and start a business thinking it would be easy. Instead, he had a rude awakening and quickly understood that he had spent 20 years being an employee and had no idea how to be a business owner. His business was tanking and he was on the brink of losing everything when he decided to fight for business freedom. In this must-read and life-changing book, author Donnie Donnie Bovine shares with readers his story intermingled with lessons learned from his mistakes and his failures. And how to be a success champion, you will find advice the author received from mentors and how he went from zero to a six-figure business. The author walks you through the steps of how to get out of your own way, how to play the game of business and win, find your strengths, how to network effectively, how to build a personal brand, how to create champions for your business, how to get great at sales, how to take complete ownership of you and your business how to be a success champion from author donnie bovine available on amazon in both kindle and paperback editions order your copy right now hello everybody and welcome to another episode of automate to dominate today we have dave chesson and he is the mastermind behind all things books so this episode is going to be crazy all about how to create passive income uh, through um, publishing books. And he's published nine books and just under $10,000 a month from those nine books, which is absolutely amazing. And he's got this like killer list. I mean, he's worked with like Ted Decker and Pat Flynn and all these like huge names that um, you just are like, wow, I can't believe this. So uh, we are super, super, super honored to have you on the show. So Dave, thank you for joining us. Well, it's really cool to be here. So thank you for having me. So tell us how in the world you got into, um, you know, books. How did that happen? Yeah, well, actually, it, it's kind of funny is uh, I grew up with dyslexia. So uh, from a very early age, I always thought that reading and writing was good, was not for me. Um, it doesn't mean that I didn't have a desire to do it. I just figured uh, it wasn't for me to do. Uh, so later on in life, you know, I joined the military, I was in the Navy and, uh, my wife and I started looking at what I was going to do after the military. And the thing was, was that I wanted to start working on whatever this trade skill was going to be, whatever it was that I was going to do. And I decided that I wanted to get into writing. Um, and a lot of that is because as a writer, you can write from anywhere. Uh, matter of fact, I wrote my first book on board a South Korean warship. Uh, wow. You know, yeah, right. First Sounds ever like book. An interesting story. <laughs> yeah, it was actually. I was. I got my own little mark in the news because of that, but uh, for good things. But um, <laughs> but even still, though, I, you know, I the pr- thing was was that someone like me, I was no Ernest Hemingway. Even at the time I wrote my first book, I wasn't this amazing writer. I wasn't so good of a writer that I could just sit down and write anything I wanted and people would love it. Instead, I learned a very valuable lesson uh, when I was doing diplomacy. And it was, if there is a room full of people and they all have the same question and you're the only person in that room that has the answer, you don't have to be the best orator. You don't have to be the greatest speaker. You don't have to be dressed the best. You don't have to do any of that. You've got the answer. And you become the light of the party. You become the one they want to talk to most. And that's it. And when I took that principle and I applied it towards book, it was a real game changer for me. It became something about under, if I understood what it was that shoppers and readers on Amazon, what they wanted and what they weren't getting. And I had, and I could just do the research to find that answer for them. I could be the one I could be the person that, they care about. Uh, a great example of this is back in the day, uh, there was a subject matter um, that was 
selling like crazy on Amazon. And it was books on Evernote, like how to use this, this program. And Evernote is a great program. I use it as a writer. It helps me to research my ideas, you know, collate, um, and then prepare for when I'm writing my books. Well, I could have written a book on Evernote, but here's the thing. There were like 400 books already on Evernote. I would have to write either the best book on Evernote out of the entire 400, which I think I was a good enough writer at the time, but good luck. <laughs> and I'd have to be the best marketer out of those 400. So I could do just like everybody else and kind of join the rat race and, you know, just really spin my wheels and get nothing done because I'm not Ernest Hemingway and I was not as good of a marketer as I am today. So instead, I started to do more research and ask myself, well, is there a market in Evernote that I can serve that isn't getting served? And when I did my research, I found that there were a lot of people going to Amazon, typing in phrases like Evernote for authors, Evernote for students, Evernote for lawyers, Evernote for project managers. And there was no books on those particular things serving that particular demographic. Now, let me ask you this. You're a teacher. Say you're a teacher and you go to Amazon and you type in Evernote for teachers. And there is one book, only one book, and it is called Evernote for Teachers. You're probably going to choose that book, right? Right. You're not going to compare it to others. You're probably not going to, you know, go nuts in the research. So long as it looks legitimate, the fact is it is the only one that answers your question. And right then and there, you have beat everybody because you are the one that has answers for those people. So and when you I started, used, sorry to interrupt. So, so no. you used long tail keywords and some research to figure out how to beat out the other 400 because you exactly the only one because of that long tail keyword. That's wow. right. And so That's in this case, sick. being able to write those books, I had a long, long revenue stream because the fact of the matter is, is that there was nobody coming. There was no other books. And yet there was always a market for it. And so it generates. Now, would I, did I make more money or, or would I have made more money with that uh, idea than if I just written an Evernote book and ranked it number one and got it number one? Uh, no, I would have made a lot more money if I was the number one book on Evernote. But guess what? I would have had to been the best marketer and the best writer to get it there. And right. I'm not. So it's a very, it was a very important lesson for me. And I, I did that through a whole bunch of books. And it was because of that, that I created my website, kindlepreneur.com to help teach people about understanding Amazon's market, what's going on and how to apply those principles that I've applied in my books. And so Kindlepreneur grew. And uh, then I created software to help people to do this faster because authors do not like Excel sheets, um, you know, and so I created software that did that and that was Publisher Rocket. And then that thing took off like crazy and now publishing companies use it like crazy, uh, sell publishers. Um, I'm pretty sure we can go as far to say it is it is the world's largest book marketing software. Um, wow. And... Uh, from there, that's what got me connected with authors like Ted Decker, Orson Scott Card, uh, Brandon Sanderson, Timothy Zahn, uh, Kevin J. Anderson. Uh, notice that there's a very heavy fantasy and, and sci-fi uh, <laughs> uh, group there because I've gotten to a point now that I, I get to work with the authors I want to and I, I'm a diehard sci-fi fan. So. Um, that's nice. so it's been really cool. And it really just started with understanding the market and serving. So when you talk about books, right, are, uh, but the website is named Kindlepreneur, right? So are you yep. creating Kindle books? Are you creating printed books? Are you doing both? Yeah, I do both. So Kindle, when you go to publish your book on Amazon, you can publish it on both Kindle slash ebook version. Uh, and they also have print version, which is a print on demand. So when you submit your book to Amazon and if somebody buys your book, Amazon will have a printing press that's close to the shopper print it right then and there and ship it and take care of it. So it's amazing and it's super easy. Um, and this is what allowed me to sell thousands of books while in South Korea and never having to lift a finger. 
I did not have to do printing. I did not have to mass order my own books, do shipping, calculate shipping, handle returns, none of it. Once you just submit those two e-copies, you know, your your Mobi file for your ebook and your PDF or e or uh, there's another form for your print on demand. Mm-hmm. Amazon takes care of it all and you just get the check at the end. Uh, you know, I, honestly, Amazon earns their 30 percent. Uh, they do a lot of great work and uh, you just get that check every month. Well, and uh, 70% is a whole lot better than going to a publisher and getting 7%. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, that's um, exactly. And I mean, if you're super good at what you do, you can maybe get it up to 30% or something like that. And by super good, I mean like you're famous and you hold some chips and you can. Right. You're like the negotiate. John Grisham of the world. Right. Right. Um. So for everybody listening, um, I'm not sure why you did this. Maybe Pritzker are super nice and you've already made it. And so you don't need it, <laughs> need the money. But if you guys look at his website, um, if you go to kindlepreneur.com slash book dash marketing dash 101, it is basically start to finish how to, to do this. And I know lots of people who are charging like five and $10,000 for this information that you're giving away for free. <laughs> so what, what made you want to do that? Well, so when I started the website, Kindlepreneur, my goal was to, to give book marketing lessons. Every article is a lesson that an author could read, understand, turn around and get a result. The thing was, was that I tackled so many different subject matters and I never left anything off. Like I went as detailed as possible. The thing is, is that I had a lot of people that said, hey, all this information is great, but where do I start? And I was like, wow, that's a really good question. As a matter of fact, uh, right on the nav bar, it says start here. And that link at the nav bar will take you right to that page. This page is honestly what if I were to write my almighty tome on book marketing, that page is it. And what you're seeing right there is a table of contents that when you click on that link, it takes you right to what I would have written as the chapter. Um, There are actually some links that point to non Kindlepreneur stuff because there are authors that did a better job than me. And that's, yeah, that's, they deserve that, that recognition. So um, I have tools, I have videos, I have articles, um, podcast interviews that, that truly help to answer those questions. But ultimately I set that up as like the online table of contents. Yep. And kind of to supplement it, what he's talking about is that, um, so he has the Kindlepreneur YouTube channel. So I would strongly recommend that you go check that out and subscribe. Um, in fact, let me get you. So it's youtube.com slash Kindlepreneur, uh, and you'll be able to pull that up. And there's guys, there's, 1.3 1.3 million views, right? So um, there's some really good information there. And then he also has a podcast, <clears throat> sorry, uh, called uh, Book Marketing Show Podcast with Dave Chesson. And there's about 65 episodes there that are just like pure knowledge. So if if you guys are looking for information on how to you know, do this between that page and those two resources, uh, did you leave any stone uncovered? <laughs> <laughs> No, but you know, the other thing about Amazon is Amazon, um, you know, in book marketing, uh, sometimes it's changing and, uh, that's, that's my key is to stay on top of it and to understand what they're doing and figure out the best way for authors, the legitimate authors to, to use that information. So as to make Amazon a better place. So I wasn't planning this when I first scheduled, uh, the interview, but I actually happen to be writing an ebook right now. Um, oh, cool just by, by happenstance. So would you be willing to kind of walk us through the steps and let me kind of go through phase one, phase two. And can we talk about like with my niche, what you would, what you would do. And so anybody listening could take their niche and duplicate it. Yeah, that sounds good to me. Okay. Awesome. So, all right. I'm in phase one before you write your book, right? So we're doing all of our research. And one of the things that I specialize in is um, outsourcing to virtual assistants or outsourcing to software. So how do I take that broad niche and focus on my long tail keywords? How do I find the, you know, like you said, um, uh, Evernote for teachers? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So a lot of what's going to happen is, is that um, you want to check to make sure that there's an existing market on Amazon or not. Okay. Sometimes we can choose to write on a subject where it sounds awesome and maybe people would love it, but people are not thinking to themselves, oh man, I should go to Amazon and I should look for a book on this subject matter. So this is kind of our, our first step is to make sure will there or will there not be an existing market on Amazon? And the truth of the matter is, is that sometimes you may find out that there won't. Now, this does not mean that you can't write that book, okay? What it does mean is, is that you want, if you decide to write that book, you cannot depend on Amazon to sell it for you. You can put it up there and maybe you'll get a couple sales here and there from time to time on Amazon. But the truth of the matter is your sales will come from you going, finding that market, grabbing them by the collar and dragging them to your Amazon sales page. Then, and that's okay because now you as an author and as a marketer know that that's what it's going to have to take. Um, if you have reason to believe that you can drive people, if you're really good at Facebook ads, if you're really good at Amazon ads, if you have a following, if you have an email list, like all of these things where you can grab somebody and bring them to your book and go for it. If you don't have those things though, uh, and this is your first foray, then understand this may be a bumpy post-launch road. So the first thing that I talk to people about in this phase one before you write a book is research to see if there's an existing market on Amazon. And there's a whole bunch of steps there to kind of talk about how you start going about it. There's ways to do it for free. There's ways to use like the, the software publisher rocket um, mm -hmm. for it to tell you, hey, all of these ideas you're having, nobody's typing them in. There aren't many words coming up. You know, there aren't other things. Books that show up for these words are not making any money. Like it can give you that or it can say, oh, yeah, there are people typing it into Amazon. And sure enough, these books are making money. Or it could even tell you people are typing it in, but the books aren't making money. And you could say, hmm, why is that? And if you start looking, you say, oh, because these books either A, don't address what this market wants, or B, you know, they're poorly put together. They've got one star or something of that magnitude. So talk to me about the freeway versus publisher rocket. Okay. Well, the freeway is, is that if you go into Amazon, I highly recommend, by the way, uh, using Chrome and then going incognito mode. Okay. In incognito mode, um, basically it makes it so your previous search history, as well as any cookies you had or logged into your Amazon account, Amazon can't use that information to provide you information. You see, Amazon likes to track what you do, what you sell, what you buy, uh, what you click on, and they change the way they show their store in order to try to increase sales to you but by going incognito mode it has none of that information so you get to see the real raw you know data and one thing you can start doing is go to the amazon search bar type into the search bar certain ideas okay phrases um that you think someone might type into amazon when searching and as you start to type amazon will start to guess at what you'll put in next so say you're typing in the words and you say like you know um uh what were the what was some of the topics you're writing on? Uh, virtual assistants or outsourcing, okay. something like that. So you could type in the word outsource, and before you even finish the 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 word outsource, Amazon will do a drop down box that says outsource, and then it might say like how to outsource or outsourcing for dummies, and you know like it's guessing. And what that information is is what people have typed into Amazon before. So now you're starting to see what other phrases or versions of this, this word uh, is that is out there. Now, I, what I like to do is I like to start with a, a pen and paper and I like to start, you know, writing down the words that I see. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so I'll keep changing it up. Maybe I'll add, we call this the A through Z method where say it's like outsource. Uh, you'll see a whole list of suggested keywords. Then I'll add an A. So outsource space A and then see if it suggests more, then I'll delete the A, and then I'll do B, yep. C, D, all the way through. And I'll then have this large list of potential keywords. Uh, so that helps me to understand what people are typing in. Some of the framework that I like to use in order to know what to type in is I like to start with kind of, and I get, take this as nonfiction for you. So for nonfiction, I like to... Uh, write a list of ways to describe pain point. 
solution, um, the benefits to the solution, and then the demographics. And I like to try to combine, so I'll make a whole bunch of words that, that represent those four columns, and then I'll like to combine them and start typing those into Amazon search box so that I can kind of see what is working and what isn't. Now, once I've done this, I have a whole giant list of keywords. The next thing I'll do is I will do a search. So, okay, I'll select one of those keyword phrases, put it in Amazon, click search, and then we'll list all the books that rank for that keyword phrase. I then like to click on the first two to three books on that keyword, and I like to see if they're making money. And authors can do this because you go down to the Amazon bestseller rank, and that's the number yep. that ranges from one to eight million, with one being the number one bestseller and eight million being the least bestseller uh, in the entire world, apparently. And you can take that number and put it into a Kindle calculator that I created. Um, just Google Kindle calculator and put it in there and it will tell you how many books that day it is sold. So now so, is, is that similar to like, um, Keepa and camel, camel, camel? So I'm, I'm not, uh, familiar with Keepa, but I think with Camel, 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 their thing is, is that you put, um, you select certain uh, products and then Camel, Camel, Camel will let you know when that product is on sale or hits a price range or am I incorrect? Um, the re the way that I used Camel, 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 I used to, um, resell books on Amazon. And so what I did was I would, I would look at is this a bestseller? And, you know, basically I want, I want a book that's, you know, 500,000 or less, um, ideally 200,000 or less. Um, but so I was basically thinking the same idea that tells you how popular that topic is type of a deal. Kind of. So the, I would say for books, you want a, a, an Amazon bestseller rank ABSR of a hundred thousand or less. Uh, okay. but be careful with um, categories. So if it's a number one bestseller in a category, I would not automatically mark that as a success because there are 14,000 Amazon categories out there. Oh, wow. And out of those 14,000, there are a lot where if you happen to select that category and you sold one book that day, you'd be the bestseller. Right. So just, just a heads up on that one. Like, so I would not base yeah, it's off of very shifting data. That was the, the problem that I had with camel, camel, camel. So how, how is your calculator a little different? Does it like aggregate the last six months or something? So ours looks ahead at kind of the sturdiness. Um, and it gives a projection of what that book is made for the month. But the mm -hmm. other thing too, is, is that our searches per month, right? So publisher rocket will tell you how many searches per month that's collected over historical value and gives you a good understanding. Pretty soon we'll be publishing information uh, to show if searches are trending up or trending down as well. So what books Amazon chooses to show in there that is dynamic and that does change. Um, but at least we'll know if the market is really looking there and shopping or not. And that I would say is stable. So Let's say um, this is slightly off topic, but I know there are going to be a bunch of people that are going to be thinking this question. So I want to ask it um, like I have a buddy, Sid, who he's a um, world traveler and all he does is write books and publish them. And he lives off the passive income. And very similar to you, he makes about $10,000 a month. So the question Sid always gets is, well, you know, I don't have a specific niche. How in the world do you know? like it's going to be a winner, right? One of his top selling books was on how to barbecue chicken or something like that. Like, so how do you find that if you're like, well, gee, I want to create a book, um, but I just want to find that niche that's really popular. I don't care what it is. And then I'm going to go write the book. Sure. Uh, uh, Publisher Rocket is definitely a tool you'd want to look into then. Um, and the way that I would do it is I would start by typing into Publisher Rocket how to and then hit search. And then Publisher Rocket will go and find hundreds of different words that, that are how to this, how to that. And you can start to see all the different things that have been typed into Amazon and then start to analyze them and look for the ones that have high searches um, that have sales but aren't too competitive. Okay. And so then from there, I, you know, so I find that golden sweet spot, that little golden nugget, you know, like your, um, you know, Evernote for teachers, right? Mm -hmm. What 
software do I use? How do I even go about starting to write this? And I know you have a bunch of slick tools on your website, so I'm hoping you can go over and tell us about those. Yeah, well, to start writing your book, I mean, uh, one does not have to go after anything special. You can always use Word or Google Docs. I actually would pr recommend Google Docs over Word. Um, the reason being is, is that if you start working with an editor, collaborating over Google Docs is so much easier um, because they can change it in real time. They can mark. Um, I just find it to be a much better process where with Word, on the other hand, you send them a copy and um, you know, you then have to like, make sure you've got the right copy. Like, oh, is this the one that they corrected or me correct that I corrected, et cetera. There's version control. Um, and I think that's more than sufficient. Uh, there are some great YouTube videos out there to teach you how to get more like, cause a lot of people say, oh man, but I like the outliner capabilities of this, this, and this It's like, you can actually pull that up on word. Um, it's just kind of, there's some hidden tricks in word, uh, that hold some of its capabilities. So maybe type into like YouTube, like how to write a book on Word document. And there are some great videos out there that will teach you how to get more out of it. However, though, I personally love a software called Scrivener. Um, it's $45, although you can find a coupon for like 20% uh, off or something that brings it down to like $37. I think it's phenomenal. Um, I've used it since, since it first came out, which is like back in 2007. I wrote my master's thesis on it um, because I just loved it that much. And now I do all my writing. I, I even write the scripts for my courses on it. Um, it's just, you know, word is made for all writing, but Scrivener was made for, for long writing and, okay. uh, it makes it so much easier. So that's the one I'd probably recommend. Okay. Awesome. So now the one thing that you don't want to do is go write this whole thing and then figure out, oh crap, it's in the wrong format. And now I have to reformat the whole thing for it to be accepted by Kindle or Amazon or, so what are the, the files that, you know, you really need to worry about? Well, in truth, I really want to worry about the files or the formatting while you write. I'd recommend just focusing on the writing because in truth and matter is, is that when you go to format your book for .mobi, which is for <laughs> ebook and EPUB for the other markets and PDF for the, for the print on demand books, um, your best bet is to take your finished Word document, you know, that you and the editor hashed out and then go to like Upwork or Fiverr to find somebody to format that into the correct file format. There yeah. is a free converter out there that Kindle offers. It's junky and a pain in the butt. Um, there is software out there that was designed solely for taking that information and formatting it. Um, Vellum is one to come, at mind, come to mind, but it only works on Mac. Um, it's also really expensive. I think it's like 300 bucks. Um, uh -huh. but there, but there are some diehard authors out there that absolutely love it to death. Um, th Scrivener, uh, will format it, uh, into all the different versions, but I'm not gonna lie. Their process is pretty painful. Like it's kind of confusing. Mm -hmm. Um, it's sort of one of the things I dislike about Scrivener's their user experience is a little hard, which is why a lot of people feel like they need a course to use it. Um, so my recommendation to most authors is just find somebody to format it for you. Do your writing the way you want to. And when you're ready, go find somebody to just turn it go, over for you. Go hit Fiverr and pass it off. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do I know, you know, what to write? How do I, you know, plan and outline my book? Well, it really comes down to your style as well as the content. But I would say that if you've decided that there's a subject matter, and I'm, I'm going to stick with nonfiction because that's that's kind of uh, what it sounds like is your realm. Um, I think that it's really important that you make sure to find all the frequently asked questions. Make sure that you address everything the person's looking for. Um, one, one case in point was I was working with an author who was writing a book on how to, how to sell art. And when we did research using Publisher Rocket, we found out that there were more people on Amazon typing in the exact phrase, how to sell art online, than those that were typing in how to sell art. Mm. Right? I mean, that's just mind blowing. It's like, wow. But when you think about it, it makes ways, it makes a lot of sense. Well, this author was only writing on the traditional sense. She had written this entire book and, and they were not, and she was not covering online sales at all. Now imagine publishing that book and people buying it, expecting there to be online components and reading nothing on it. 
Right. They would have lost it. Uh, that the reviews would have been bad, even if it wasn't a good book. So knowing what it is that people really want and understanding all the frequently asked questions and where that is, I think that's extremely important in putting together your book. Now, I personally have my own um, I have my own style to nonfiction. And it's sort of something I like to do. I, I learned it off of um, the author who wrote 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. Uh, I can't believe his name is escaping me. I can't want to say Maxwell. John C. Brian, Maxwell. There we go. Brian Tracy? Nope. John C. Maxwell. Oh, um, okay. Is it, is it 17? 21. Anyways, John Something. C. Maxwell's book, he has this, this system where he likes to kind of do what I call a case study sandwich. Okay. And in it, the first chapter always begins with a case study, you know, talking about somebody. So like, for example, the first chapter of his book, he talks about, you know, um, McDonald's, right? That, you know, Ray Kroc, and the title of it was, you know, uh, uh, the lid, you know, the lid is either half full or full. And what it was, was that the McDonald brothers only had a lid of leadership that allowed them to create two McDonald's. But Ray Kroc stepped in and made McDonald's into what it is today because he had a greater lid. So he tells the story, this true story that just hooks you in. And then he explains the lesson learned inside of it. And then the conclusion is combining the two, making it so that you see that, you know, this example that you read, the story that you just got put into has such a, a great meaning. And what I love about this structure, and you go flip through the chapters, you'll see it. But what I love about this chapter is, or this structure is that to this day, I remember his laws of leadership. I remember most of them because I remember the stories. Mm -hmm. And the truth of the matter is we learn so much through story. And I will place greater value on a book that doesn't just teach me things, but tells me stories and through stories teaches me. So like a while ago, I was writing a, a book on language learning. And so I started by finding this, this true story about the first person to go into the emperor's court in China, the first non-Chinese person, the first Westerner. And this Westerner uh, was the first to go because he had figured out how to crack the Chinese language. That, and he became so good at it that the emperor and all the people under him were so entertained by his ability to, to do this that he made it all the way to see the emperor, which is huge. I mean, nobody got to see him. And um, there was a lesson on, on specifically on his mind castle. And it's what he created to help compartmentalize and better understand. And then we talk about the strategy of compartmentalizing and mind castling and how you do it. And that is the beginning to the entire book. So when outlining nonfiction, I think it's really important to do your research to find real case studies, real practical examples. And when you can write it to be a little bit of storytelling, oh man, do people get interested? I'll, I'll ask the listeners right here and yourself, like maybe language learning was not on the forefront of your mind, but I'll bet you're a bit more interested about language learning now that you heard about this crazy story about the dude, you know, that I just described. Yeah, it's true. Probably m one of my favorite books of all time is The Go-Giver. Um, and that's what he does is he he teaches you, um, you know, business principles through storytelling. And it's 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 a quick, wow. easy read. And it's just um, amazing. And he does he does exactly what you just said. So, yeah, it's I think that's a real sweet spot. And I I get motivated to write the next chapter because I know the stories. And we were it's funny, we were talking about Evernote earlier. That's one of the biggest things I use Evernote for is to find the case studies and the stories and then compartmentalize and then come back to it and know that I have a juicy, uh interesting, inspiring chapter instead of just informational. So where are you going to get this research? Are you, are you going to ask the public? Are you going to Cora? Wh where are you going? Yeah. Ask the public is a great one. Um, especially if you're on a broad area and ask the public for those who don't know is a search engine who's designed to basically show you frequently asked questions. Um, another one, Cora can be, I'll, I'll definitely, I've gone there and I've typed in a subject matter and seen if there are any questions surrounding it. 
Um, be careful because you'll get a lot of misinformation there too, though. Uh, you definitely don't want to publish a book and be wrong. <laughs> um, that would be bad. <laughs> right. Uh, another thing is I love forums. Um, if there is a forum out there that's on your subject matter or close, like there's an artist's format, you know, so we are talking about like how, how to sell art online, um, you know, artists will complain about sales. I love it, not just from the whole, let me answer that question, but also what are the words the artists are using when describing the pain point they have over the fact that they're not making any money? I mean, because let's face it, we got to write our book description too, right? So as I'm doing this research, I'm collecting it all. I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of that person. I'm trying to understand why is it that somebody would come uh, to Amazon to buy a book on a software, you know, why is Evernote so crazy that people would do that and flock to it? So I'm looking for all these things, not just the questions themselves as well. And I think that's a huge point because so many people don't think outside the box like that, right? They're just like, okay, find A, B, and C. And, you know, and I think that's one of the things that probably I would imagine has distinguished you um, from you know, everybody else to be able to set yourself apart in the market. And it, and you kind of have that whole section, even like, you know, putting your book together, right? So how do you find your title? How do you find your subtitles? How do you make it eye catching? So, it, you know, it's not boring and somebody wants to open the cover. Um, and I would imagine, so how do you weave all those parts into it? Yeah, that's a, a really good question. Um, I think a lot of it is, is like, I will go into Scrivener and they have an um, they have a corkboard layout and I will find all these interesting tidbits or interesting aspects and I will then put I'll create a, a note card in the corkboard that's one and I'll kind of rearrange them and move them around and as I'm pulling and, and researching and learning I'm starting you know what I love too is sometimes it's really great to be somebody who's new to the subject as you're writing the book because I have questions that if I was the master, I may not think was a question, you know, um, it, it's worked out well for a lot of the subject areas where I'm just like, wait a second, I don't fully understand that. What is the difference between that and that? Oh, yeah, that'd be a great chapter, you know? And so as I'm doing my research, I'm just throwing these ideas on there. And then finally, I won't start writing until I feel like there's a linear flow to the information and there's no gap and that I know, and this is key, is that I know that when you go from the beginning to the end, that I can say to myself, I have solved this person's problem, I, that they will get this result, and that it is for this person. And again, it just came back to the four things that I wrote all those ideas on, right? At the beginning, we were looking at, you know, researching whether or not this book will work. It really comes back to that. I can deliver on this, that I, they will do this, and they will get this, and this is who they are bingo, you know? Um, and then at that point it's, it's filling in the, the, the sandwich, as I called it, you know, where I I've already got that, you know, and sometimes I got to spend a lot of time looking for a good story on it. Um, and I'll tell you too, any of the nonfiction writers out there, if you can't seem to find some really amazing, uh, historical story or something like that, think about your own experience. Maybe there's something that you had happen to you that would fit. Um, if not, then give an example, okay? Uh, you know, um, make it make it understood you're not making this up. Like you're not trying to pass it off as true, but, you know, give the example, you know? there. Uh, sometimes being stuck in this certain mode can make someone feel. Imagine yourself as so-and-so, you know, that you're in this, that you're doing this. How did that make you feel? Like that is one way that when I just can't find a historical example, I'll just I'll, I'll put that as my, my case study. That's a, a great way to think of it. Cause sometimes, you know, I, I, like, even if I'm doing like a video or something, I'm like scratching my head and I'm like, what in the world, how can I make this, you know, relate? So you take like something that's, you know, maybe technical and boring, like, okay, here's a great example. This will, you'll, you'll probably laugh, but, um, I created a little, uh, little mini, video series yesterday called, um, you know, software is so sexy. And it's how I use software to automate the back, the back end of my business. And what I tried to do was tell stories about how I use each one and give examples versus just here's a piece of software, 
blah, go have fun. Um, cause nobody cares about that. That's boring. <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So sometimes when we're in the nonfiction world, we can sit there and we can just try to parcel out the information and that's cool. But I really feel that stories are the best way to learn. So let's provide them with it. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I think, I think you can learn and be entertaining at the same time. And I think that sets you, you know, apart from, uh, from others where, you know, that's where you get your tribe of followers, right? Exactly. Uh, here's an example that I used a bit ago. Um, I was writing, I'd actually never finished this book, uh, which is that, but it was the Evernote for, uh, authors. Right. And I told the story of a woman who, you know, single mother, here, you know, she would travel the train back and forth every day. And one day while she was on the train, she had this amazing idea. It was such a good idea that she quickly grabbed pen and she wrote it on a napkin. And this napkin um, turned into the outline for Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone. I love that story. You yep. know, and the fact of the matter is, and what's funny is the other part of her story is too, is, is that she once wrote, I don't remember which one of the Harry Potters, but she wrote a key component to it. That's one of her favorite parts on a barf bag. <laughs> Obviously, uh, she, she needed Evernote because uh, we authors, you never know when, when it's going to strike, when all of a sudden you're walking and something connects, when all of a sudden you see something, you see a scene you see a person and it's like that's my character that's who it you know and and i have definitely whipped out my camera and snapped a picture of someone because i'm like hey, you are now my villain <laughs> we don't need to talk about this but i am visually using you and describing <laughs> that weaselly villain who's got that you got the smirk good on you and you know what? There it is. It's in my it's in my uh, Evernote so that I can use it and I'll tag it and voila. And so I took, you know, uh, I took the Harry Potter story to hook you into something you truly know. Then I told my story and a practicality of it. So now let's go ahead and get into how you do it. Yeah, that's so if I had, um, you know, let's say so you have nine books out there. Let's say I wanted to buy one of your books to use as a model, right, to mm -hmm. create my own book. Which one would you say you just nailed it out of the park and really accomplished that um, to be able to to use as a model to build another book? Oof, that's a really good question. Um I'd have to think about that. <sighs> Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the spot. <laughs> no, it, it's it's sort of funny. It's like um, I once, I think it was um, uh, that director, uh, Quentin Tarantino. Somebody once asked him, "What's your favorite favorite movie?" And I think he like lost his mind and like trying to think of it. And and yeah, I would I would have thought he'd be the easiest one to say what his favorite movie is. Uh, I, I heard a report to um, the director who did the who won the award Parasite, um, you know, the, the Korean film, uh, that director and Quentin Tarantino get together in Busan like every year at the Busan International Film Festival. They rent uh -huh. out a place and they watch each other's films and they get like apparently they get royally trashed. But um, <laughs> It's funny is they, they call it like the most self masochistic atmosphere to like read. So it's kind of funny is like when I start looking at my books, I'm like, oh, jeepers, huh? Well, mm. <laughs> yeah, I think I we're know. all That's like that question. though, aren't we? We're like, no, yeah. I can't imagine, especially for like movies, you know, because like, oh, there's like the critics and well, I mean, we have our own critics as writers, huh? But what everybody gets to, to give listen it a is Dave Chesson is still human. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I'll have to give that a thought. I'll get back to you on that. Okay, cool. So let's say I've gone through, I've created it, it's at Amazon, right? And I don't want to just let it sit there and have um, just Amazon market it. What can I do to market my own book? Well, first thing is, is that if you have an email list, that's awesome. That's going to help you out, okay? Uh, if you have followers that are in your area, that's amazing. Uh, if not, uh, you have tactics like Facebook ads, um, setting up Facebook ads to find your kind of reader and then direct them to your book. 
uh, Amazon ads is phenomenal because you can interrupt uh, a searcher's search and kind of get in front of them. Uh, this is great because like, for example, I didn't even uh, know Amazon had ads. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Matter of fact, I got a full free uh, video course on doing Amazon ads. You can find it at amscourse.com. Uh, no joke, hundred percent free. And I teach everything I know. So there's no like, then pay me for the 10% I didn't tell you. Like, no, that's, that's it. Um, and uh, I was working with a lady who is, she had a book on like dealing with pet death, uh, you know, um, and kind of like uh, the depression of that. And interesting enough, like not many people go to Amazon and say, oh man, pet death, you know, or there actually there's a better term. I can't remember. It's, it wasn't so abrupt as pet death, but maybe like um, grieving your, yeah, grieving the loss of your like family yeah. member. <laughs> it's something like, like that. Well, people don't think to go there, but it doesn't mean that shoppers on Amazon don't have something they're dealing with. Right. So her book was going to be one of those where it's like, you're not, you you may get some sales here and there, but you're not going to get a lot of sales. Like you're going to need to depend on your ability to get in front of those because we all know there are lots of people who could use this book and they're dealing with pet death. So she designed, um, we designed this Amazon ads and we centered it around getting it in front of the movie, A Dog's Life. Like if you're going to Amazon and you're okay. purchasing a dog's life, you're probably a big pet person, especially dog. Yeah. And since apparently, which I didn't know this at the time, it was about a dog that every time it passes, it goes into another younger dog. Or yeah, something. it's like like reincarnation for pets. reincarnation for pets, right? To, yeah. to follow this one human. Yeah. And uh, so obviously that's pulling on that kind of heartstring, which means you're probably one of those people that that would totally benefit from this. Well, let me tell you, she made way more money from her Amazon ads than she would have just sitting there waiting for it because she got in front. She interrupted and got in front of those shoppers before they could purchase A Dog's Life, the movie. So wow, again, I think that's a really important lesson for authors. Another another example that we once did too is I was working with a hard science uh, fiction writer. And for those who don't know hard science, is a science fiction that does its best to be as factual as possible. You know, you don't get to pull zero G's, you know, and just do these crazy maneuvers. No, 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 no. You got to like create, you know, slow down, you know, and it takes like years before you can slow down to reverse course, you know, Um, or anyways. So the point is, is that you got to be kind of a science nerd to do it. So for this person, we actually set up some Amazon ads to get in front of astrophysics quantum physics textbooks all that Ah. because no fiction authors are thinking about putting their sci-fi in front of it but let me tell you if you are shopping on amazon for your latest fix of quantum mechanics i assure you you're probably a hard science fiction fan um, and you may be looking for some entertainment so sure enough set up the ads most successful ads that that person's ever had wow interrupted marketing wow okay that now that is outside of the box that's that's slick. Like I would have never thought, you know, somebody who's looking for a textbook to put a sci-fi book in front of them, but it makes complete sense. Right. Cause that's what they're, I mean, my brother is like sci-fi to the max. Like he completely geeks out on the stuff. Like we go home to visit and we talk about wormholes and I'm like, "Uh uh-huh. Yep. And, (laughs) and I mean, it's actually, it's really cool to talk with him about it, but he like, whoa, expands into this whole stuff. And I'm like, what are you talking about? But he would like, he's the kind of guy that would buy the book to learn it, the, buy the textbook, but then he wants to read the sci-fi to be entertained by it. So he can take, because nobody understands his brain, right? Nobody can understand the textbook and then turn it into sci-fi where it's entertainment for him. So that's, that's brilliant. Yeah. And another example of this too, is working with Pat Flynn when we did his uh, advertisement for his book. And I actually show this in the course. It's a, it's one of the case studies is that we were doing all this keyword research we pulled. And by the way, when we do the Amazon ads, you got to get lots of Amazon ads, right? Um, lots of keywords, lots of keywords. Um, you can't just choose like five and be like, those are the ones I want. And then hunker down and enjoy. Um, instead though, through that research, we found that one of his highest converting keywords was the word Ivanka Trump. Now that may be like super surprising. Wow. Because, yeah, like that is not. His, what in the world his was his name. book on? It was on how to start a business. It was actually on how to verify your business idea will succeed. 
and it was called Will It Fly, right? Wow. Well, we we analyze, and this is a part of the course, is you look at the keywords that are succeeding and you ask yourself, why? Like, why would that be? And by the way, I was not intelligent enough to sit there and uh, think up the, the dog's life thing. I didn't even know what that was, but we were looking at her results and the keyword phrase, a dog's life, which I have the whole process on how you can come across those in the course, uh, was like crushing it. And then I was, I asked her, I was like, why? And she goes, oh, that's a new movie on the reincarnation of dogs. And I'm like, go oh, light bulb, you know? Um, same thing with, with uh, Pat Flynn was, we were like, why Ivanka Trump? And what we figured and tested and saw was that people were, and again, this is not politics, not nothing, not getting into any of that, uh, just stating marketing fact here, is that we found that people were searching for her and basically what they were searching for was female entrepreneurs, successful female entrepreneurs. So we decided to take that and create an entire keyword campaign centered on female entrepreneurs. So we found every female entrepreneur that was famous or whatever. And we created that as a giant campaign full of keywords and tweaked the, the, the blurb to target that. And sure enough, by far most successful campaign because everybody else was, and again, not being sexist, just pointing out marketing data. All the other authors were thinking probably male entrepreneurs yep. and nobody was, was focusing on the female entrepreneurs. And therefore our cost per click was so much lower and because we were actually tailored the blurb to be towards that, we connected with that market even better and therefore got much better results. So you keep saying the course. Do you mean the AWS course or do you mean the book marketing 101? The I'm sorry, the AMS course. Oh, I'm sorry, AMS. AMS. Yep. Sorry. Amazon ads. Yep. I've got I've got isn't Amazon AWS or something like that? Anyway, no, sorry. AWS is their server system. They're, they're okay. Cloud. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then they they called Amazon Ads. They called it AMS. And then, no kidding, they then decided to change the names to Amazon Book Ads. But they haven't exactly changed the word everywhere else. So as old school people still call it AMS. But what's funny is even on their homepage, it still says AMS. It's like if you're gonna change your name, Amazon, wouldn't you at least change your homepage to say so? But anyways, so a little inside there, you'll hear AMS or Amazon book ads, but yep, okay. you can find that full free video course at amscourse.com. Sweet. Okay. So we have three minutes and I want to be super cognitive of your time here. How, I mean, you've just given us so much knowledge. How can we support you? Oh, um, well, you know, as you're reading any of the articles, if you have any comments or if anything has really helped you, leave them in the comments. I love reading those. And I also answer all those questions too. So if anybody has any questions, just drop them there too. And what is uh, Publisher Rocket cost? It's $97. It's a one-time cost. So there's no subscription. There's no, uh, no nothing like that. And every time we come out with a new feature or a new uh, update or upgrade, uh, it's always free. Wow. That, that's incredible. Um, just that alone, like you should be charging way, way more money. For. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm the kind of guy where I always hated it when software did that to me, like, Oh, we improved ourselves. So now you got to pay us for these improvements or, Hey, we've updated. And, um, if you want to keep getting updates, you got to keep paying us. I'm like, I'm just, I'm the kind of guy who's like, nah, <laughs> so, so I can't do it myself. Now that you've got all this passive income, what, what does a day in Dave Chesson's life look like? Oh boy. Yeah. Um, well, interesting enough, a lot of people don't know this, but I have 27 people on my team. Um, wow. so yeah, so a lot of it's just meetings, 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 meetings. Uh, today I had the uh, full team meeting, um, for an hour. Then I had one podcast interview. Then I had this one. Uh, then after this, I've got a meeting with another person. I, I, I have another business as well. So we have to go over that uh, and writing time. Although one thing that's really important is, and I think this is a huge thing to, to leave everybody with, is that when it comes to writing, writing is something that you, like if you put it at the end of your list, you never get to it. Like just, it's one of those things where you'll find everything and anything to get done before you sit down to write it. The other thing too is, is that sometimes when it's on my list, I'll be like, ah, oh, no, creativity is just not striking me right now. I'll, I'll get to it when I get to it. And when you do that, you get nothing done. So what I do is um, I have a sort of reverse Pavlov's dog. And what I do 
is I, I to this day, still get up um, at 4.30 in the morning. I do not allow myself to have coffee that day. Oh, that's unless, so Unless, I know, yeah, it's just very self-masochistic. Um, <laughs> unless I get up early enough and I write. So I now have the system of like, it, it's funny is when I start drinking coffee, which by the way, this is leftovers from my uh, 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 coffee this see, morning. I, yep. Yep. Me too. <laughs> coffee is for writers. It's, it's my own. It's like, if I taste coffee, it means I have to write. Like it, it's just, so it's what I call my reverse Pavlov's dog here. Um, so the, t- the taste of writing is coffee and it's a wonderful thing in my mind. So now I awesome. write a lot. So, so I it's recommend like eat that, eat that frog, right? That's right. Eat that frog or, or, you know, drink that. I, I like the more delicious coffee than the frog, but yes, <laughs> yes. Um, um, so even with everything that goes on, I still make it that it is part of the first thing in my day so that I can't put it off. And I still will not allow myself coffee in unless I get some writing done. And if I don't have something to write, I figure out something to write. <laughs> like read right. your comments. That's awesome. Well, guys, there you go. No coffee for any of you until you get on here and you check out Dave's information and take one step towards your next book. Cause that is, this is all about passive income streams. And this is one that's a huge bound of work in the front end. And then you get to sit back and relax kind of. <laughs> so, um, Dave, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. And we will see you guys next time on automate to dominate. Thank you for tuning in to the automate to dominate podcast at www.awesomeoutsourcing.com slash podcast. My name is Michelle Thompson. Hey guys, if you absolutely love this show, I would greatly appreciate it if you would head on over to iTunes, subscribe and leave us a five-star written review. That would be amazing. And as always, if you guys know somebody who should be listening to this podcast, Please don't keep it all to yourself. Share it with your friends.